Thank you very much, and welcome everybody uh, to the panel on the future of NFTs. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> We all know what that is. Um, so, no, this is the Software and Resilience panel, so welcome. Um, so, we have got an, a stellar lineup, really, as you can tell. Um, and um, I'm going to introduce them from, from this end. Uh, so, first of all, uh, we have uh, Camille Stewart Gloucester, uh, who's the Deputy National Cyber Director at, at the Technology and Ecosys Ecosystem Security Division at the Office of the National Cyber Director at the White House in the United States. <laughs> That's the shortest job title I've ever yeah. heard. <laughs> then we have uh, Charlie Gladstone, um, who's Head of Software Resilience at the Department for Science, Innovation and Technology in the UK. Um, then we... Who's this, who's this guy? Does anybody know this guy? The show of hands, does anyone...? No. no. <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> Dr. Alan Friedman. <laughs> Um, who is the Senior Advisor and Strategist at the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, CISA, in the United States. Welcome, Alan. Uh, and myself, uh, so my name is David Rogers, and uh, I advise the UK government on some security stuff, and I also am the Chair of the Fraud and Security Group at the, at the Mobile Industry Association, the GSMA. So, um, I'm just here to uh, kind of facilitate here, and I'm also standing in for Jan Ellis, uh, who unfortunately can't be here, and uh, we all send her uh, our best wishes as well, um, and uh, hopefully she's watching uh, live now. Hi, Jen. <laughs> so, um, so, we're going to kind of split this up, and we would like to have uh, quite a lot of audience participation, so um, please, somebody's starting to fall asleep already. Yeah. So, so, yeah, you. <laughs> Get off your phone. <laughs> hey, that woke you up, didn't it? <laughs> it's going to get better. Um, so, um, we're going to talk about a global approach to tackling software resilience, because software resilience isn't the biggest problem we've got in cyber. <laughs> For one of. Um, networks. Yeah, networks, yeah. Cars. Phones. Yeah. We'll all be in a job anyway for a few years. So, um, yeah, so what we're going to do is we're going to kind of flip through the risks. Well, we'll spend a little bit of time on the risks. Then we'll talk about the challenges. Then we'll talk about the solutions. And throughout this, you can ask any question, any question to the panelists that you like. I can't promise you that they'll answer them. To the, to the other panelists. <laughs> And um, yeah, we'll see how we get on. So, so start thinking about some of the questions that you'd like to ask the panelists. You know, you don't get to meet these people every day, uh, thankfully. <laughs> but, uh, but, but please do, you know, you, now's your opportunity. So, um, I'm gonna start with Camille. So, welcome Camille. Thanks for having me, hi everyone. So, what does software resilience mean to you? Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start at, you know, what my office does. How many of you are familiar with the Office of the National? Can, can people hear, hear you? Yeah. Okay, then I'll have to pick this thing up. Okay, can you hear me now? Okay. How many of you are familiar with the Office of the National Cyber Director? Oh, I love that as I do this over the last year, more hands go up in a room. <laughs> but just to level set for anyone who is not familiar, the Office of the National Cyber Director is the newest office in the Executive Office of the President, organized to orient ourselves around the national cyber policy. How do we set an agenda for uh, the United States around cyber policy? And we aim to do that in four ways. One, drive federal coherence. Two, uh, embark on public-private partnerships. And when I say private, I mean in the broadest sense, all non-federal partners, state and local, international partners, um, private sector, industry, everyone. Uh, we want to align resources to aspirations, so we got to make sure the money is there to do the work that we said we want to do, and we want to focus on future resilience. And that's really where my division sits, is a focus on future resilience of people and technology. And on the technology side, which is most germane to this conversation, one of the biggest pieces of that is supply chain security. And of course, within that, supply, uh, software supply chain security. And um, you know, at ONCD, we are really focused on thinking about the connection between uh, the supply chain to all of the priorities that we have set 
as a nation and in this international ecosystem. And we recognize that that has to be a global endeavor. If you've taken a look at the national cybersecurity strategy, you'll see global supply chains called out explicitly. But also what you'll notice is that supply chain security is a thread throughout all of the pillars. That's how we become more defensible. It's how we move towards that affirmative vision we said. It's a piece of the puzzle as we think about shifting market forces and all of those things. And so it's a real priority for us as an organization. And, and as we think about software in particular, we've really honed in on what is the most atomic unit, and that's the code. And so how do we make sure we have resilience in the code, that it is defensible? And that you know, raises two things. One, how are we thinking about open source software security? How are we focused on the most composable parts of the, of the ecosystem, right? So one of the greatest things about our software is that some really smart and um, generous people have decided to like make code and make it available to a bunch of people. That's something we want to incentivize, but also means that there are inconsistent standards, that things are um, insecure, and we really need to focus on making sure that security is a part of the model when we develop code whether it's open source, whether it's proprietary, and most proprietary code is built on open source code as well. It includes some open source code. So when we think about that, how are we going to advance the work there? Um, we, we really want to focus on collaborating with our partners, our international partners, our private sector partners, to understand the scope of the problem and the opportunities. And you'll see in the national cybersecurity strategy, two of the biggest way we do that is that open source software security initiative and software liability and thinking about that. And I'm sure we'll, we'll get into that more as we have the conversation, but just want to highlight those things. I think good start. Okay, and over to you, Charlie. Great. Uh, can you guys hear me all right? Super. Um, I might actually steal your, uh, your idea, Camille, uh, because I'm expecting probably fewer people, but uh, could you guys raise your hands if you've heard of the UK Department for Science, Innovation, and Technology? Okay. Actually, you know, pretty good. I don't blame you because uh, DSIT, as we're known, uh, was only actually created about six months ago. Um, and it was a sort of a, a new department um, based on a combination of uh, uh, the, what was previously the Department for Digital, Culture, Media, and Sport, which is, uh, as you can imagine, is a pretty broad department. So they basically took the D of DCMS uh, and merged it with uh, some different aspects of our Department for Business, Energy, and Industrial Strategy to create a new department whose uh, sort of real overarching ambition is to uh, really cement the UK's position as a science and technology superpower in the world. Uh, it, you know, in practice, that's still a, a, an incredibly broad remit. You know, everything from sort of space policy, science and innovation, artificial intelligence, but also obviously cybersecurity. Um, and cybersecurity is, is split in terms of res responsibilities across a few departments in the British government. So, Specifically, DSIT is responsible for uh, developing the UK's cyber ecosystem and actually growing the sector, um, helping to secure the technologies that we use on a day-to-day -day basis, and also uh, is responsible for uh, organizational resilience when it comes to cyber security. Uh, so, you know, obviously uh, quite a few of the different uh, uh, themes of that uh, I think I'm definitely keen to discuss today. So, in terms of what the UK is interested in, I mean, I think, I imagine most of uh, uh, the crowd here appreciates why software security is important. You know, it's the absolute lifeblood of the digital economy and um, is absolutely key to driving innovation in the tech sector, but also, you know, realistically in modern day, it's also key for all sorts of organizations' productivity. Um, and in the UK, we are one sort of, one of the largest consumers of software in Europe, um, but uh, we're also sort of have a really significant developer presence, so I think we're, we're sort of interested in it from, from all sides. Um, our work sort of looking particularly at software supply chains uh, stemmed from a core for views that we held in, in 2021 looking at uh, supply chain risks uh, relating to cyber in general. Uh, and one of the key things that came out of that was that software supply chains weren't just the biggest risk, but they were actually something that really needed uh, more investigation and, and really more of a deep dive into it. So um, in February this year, we published a call for views looking specifically at uh, resilience and security about software used by businesses and organizations in the UK. Uh, and there we sort of set out some of the risks that we were identifying across the software lifecycle. Um, we also asked for views on sort of what industry and, 
and the sector is already doing to mitigate some of those risks. Uh, but crucially, we also asked for views on what the government should actually do about it. Uh, so that closed in May, and we've spent the last few months sort of listening to views and, and really understanding the quite wide range of views that we heard through that, uh, through that call for views. Uh, so today, I, I'm really keen to sort of share some of those things that we've heard, um, but also I'm definitely here to listen as well. So yeah, as uh, David said, really keen for questions, but also I would love for anyone to just share their views on what the risks are in this space, uh, you know, um, anything really. Uh, I'm definitely here to listen as well. So yeah, I mean, thanks again to DEF CON for, for having me. I think hopefully this is gonna be a really great conversation. Great. You could tell that out of this panel, I'm the one that said he doesn't need a mic. Uh, <laughs> you shouldn't have a mic, I guess. It's feeling know. left out now, isn't it? Borrow this for, for a moment. Ah. Sorry. Mic is on. All right, S bomb. Hi, my name's Alan. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we agreed that, that, that Alan's not allowed to talk about S bomb on the panel. This, this causes me physical pain. Uh, but no, right? The, the, we won't talk about the specifics of implementation unless folks want to get into it. But when you are starting to try to build this, there, there are sort of a couple of phenomena, which is that one, everyone in the world is now a software company, right? We, we all know this. We have amazing people from avionics and automotive and medical. Uh, I, in DC, you say law firms are software companies, and they're like, don't be ridiculous. And then you say Panama Papers, and they say, oh, oh right. Um, so we, we, we sort of have this model, and so that means that the solutions that we advocate have to scale for the entire ecosystem. Uh, and that started off as you start an initiative around different approaches to advancing new technology, new paths to transparency, new tools. We all start at the same starting point. So we actually can coordinate. One of our fun challenges moving forward as we think about resilience is we all advance at different paces. So in the cloud native world, s -bombs kind of solved, it's boring. There's a Docker command called s -bomb. You know what it does? It gives you an s -bomb. Now, there are several of you in this room that I've shared the stage with who hate when I use that example because, you know what? That doesn't work for a new satellite uh, addressable transformer, right? They, the people that make OT, the people that make the stuff that affects human safety don't really use that kind of cloud native technology yet. So we need to sort of understand that. So that's one of the, the, the higher level challenges that we have in the policy space is how do we work with the full richness of the software community? And then the second piece, of course, we, we haven't done a good job of defining resiliency. And part of the problem is there's a famous, very popular internet pastime that was famously defined by the US Supreme Court, which is, well, we don't know how to define it, but we know it when we see it. Uh, and, and resiliency, I think, fits. <laughs> you, you remember that time that I was in the panel at the White House? Uh, you remember when they used to let me speak in public? Uh, so, so part of the problem, and I, I think my approach at CISA, where we look to our friends at the White House and partner with them on the high-level strategy, but a lot of the work that we do at CISA is identifying what are concrete things that we can work on and build coalitions around uh, that make a tangible difference. And so, of course, we'll spend a lot of time today talking about the first step, which is transparency. Right? You gotta know what you have. You have to know what's out there. And that also creates some challenges. So Camille talked about liability. Accountability and transparency play terribly together, but we need both of them, right? We need a way to encourage good actors to talk about what they're doing and have visibility, uh, not just from government regulators, but from private contracts, uh, right? If everyone is in the supply chain, most of us are in the middle. And so uh, how do we have that while still saying, you know what? If you don't do the basics, if you don't do accepted practices, we're going to ask why, and sometime we're going to ask why with teeth. And so that's one of the, the other tensions that we need to resolve. 
Okay. So I feel like we're talking solutions already, and we have a, we need to rewind a little bit and go. Why why are we all sat here? <laughs> like why, what what is it about software resiliency that is a problem, and what, why are we thinking about these solutions? Are there any? I, I mean, I, I'm happy for you to give examples or or specific sort of things that, that you think are of concern. So um, uh, Camille's got the mic. So. Yeah. So. Um, much like what Charlie talked about, we embarked on a journey in 2022 to really understand the, especially the open source software ecosystem, but the software ecosystem as a whole, and see how the federal government should support the evolution towards a more secure environment, more secure software. And we established something called the Open Source Software Security Initiative that convenes partners like CISA, that includes DARPA and OMB and a number of other partners throughout the federal government to really think about what is the work that we're already doing, where does the ecosystem need support, and what are the opportunities for us in the future um, to add to the evolution that we're talking about. We went to London and we launched that initiative after we had done this in-depth analysis. And some of the things that we found were that, you know, in addition to malign actors trying to leverage software vulnerabilities um, to wage attacks, right, whether that is state actors um, or not, there were some opportunities, right? The opacity of the incentives for developers to incorporate security into their development life cycle, it, it, it's not there, right? The transparency that Alan was talking about, it is hard to incentivize that behavior, particularly in the open source context. Um, we need transparency, better transparency into the code that's in our environments of every organization, whether that is a government or a private sector organization. We saw that in spades in log 4 shell right? Uh, there were a number of organizations that the biggest part of their challenge was just figuring out what's in their code base. And folks were scrambling to figure out not, what was in, not only what the things that they had incorporated themselves, but what their vendors had incorporated such that they needed to remediate that. That's a problem. That, that's you know, part of what Alan is trying to solve with SBOMs, but something we all need to be thinking about, like how do we marry that up with these security vulnerabilities? We need better data and better connectivity between something like an SBOMs and the security vulnerabilities that present themselves. And how do we automate that and leverage that in a way that makes it actionable and easy to implement quickly? And then another thing that we really focused on, especially in the open source context, but in general, is memory safe languages. How do we advance transitioning from memory unsafe languages to memory safe languages? That is a huge opportunity for all of our governments um, to play a role in the evolution of the ecosystem. If we migrate large code bases from memory unsafe languages to memory safe languages, we remediate up to 70% of security vulnerabilities. That is not the only solution, but that is a solution that we can advance in a very meaningful way. So how do we do that? How do we get creative about the tools that we leverage to advance that? Is it cyber insurance? Is it the liability structures that we're talking about? Is it some other incentive structure that encourages this evolution and change in the market and environment? And so a lot of our work has been collaborating with our international partners, leveraging the insights they gain from some of their um, engagement with industry and our engagement with industry, like we have an RFI that we released this week on open source software security. We, I hope all of you reply to it. We have one on regulatory harmonization. That data, that collaboration with our partners is really key towards us better understanding the space and being able to advance not only things like funding and leveraging the, per, the federal purse to advance behavior, but what are the other ways that we can be supporting the ecosystem to drive software security and software resilience? So I'm going to try and not be too repetitive, uh, and I take it as a good sign that uh, a lot of the issues we've identified are also the ones that have been identified <laughs> by the White House. Um, I think, uh, so in our call for views, we set out uh, a sort of a full risk framework looking at risks in software development, looking at sort of barriers to security in open source software, uh, risks around the distribution of software and sort of software resellers and the, the unique challenges around that. Uh, and also around sort of procurement, maintenance, and end use by uh, customer organizations who sort of you know, buy and use software. 
Um, and somewhat unhelpfully, I'd say the, the views we've heard is that all of those areas are important and need to be addressed, <laughs> which is true. Um, but I think in, in terms of sort of key threats, at its core, insecurely developed software is still the, the most important thing. And it's still the thing that we've heard from all of the people we've spoken to uh, that's the thing they're most concerned about. And that actually a, a lot of the organizations we spoke to through this call for views um, said that it was, if not one of the most, actually the most uh, significant threat to their organization's resilience. Uh, you know, it was either uh, software that has accidentally introduced vulnerabilities or intentionally introduced vulnerabilities. So, you know, there are a lot of different threats here, but uh, uh, to some extent, that the most fundamental one remains the, the, the key issue, right? Um, but we did also hear a lot of uh, a lot of the same things that uh, Camille was talking about. Uh, I think memory unsafe language came up a lot, um, as did the use of secure development environments. Uh, but at its core, the, the issue that I think a lot of people identified was, uh, as you were saying, that, that the market incentives just aren't there to prioritize secure development. Um, and, and while this is a challenge for software vendors, uh, the actual, the, the core problem is also that customers and, and the organizations who buy this software fundamentally only care about two things. It's, you know, how well does it work and how cheap is it? Um, and security is often a second thought, right? Uh, and, and if securely developing your software isn't a thing that allows you to differentiate your product in the market, then it's, it's not gonna be something which companies are investing huge amounts of money in. So I think it's a really massive challenge. Um, and yeah, I mean, we'll get, on to, we'll get on to solutions, but I think you know, we do need to think more about how the government can influence that and, and try and address that, that uh, sort of, that market failure. So I just want to break that down a little bit. So, um, so what you're saying is about insecurely developed software, but also obviously the languages, uh, you know, we, we don't, you know, there's a lack of type safety and, and memory safety issues, but we're starting to see the languages come through. But um, surely there's an education question for developers as well. So most of us who've done software engineering degrees um, know that there's no mandatory security modules in, and most of the software engineers that I work with don't have a clue about secure development, even though there's plenty of secure coding books out there. Uh, I, I'm one of my students, uh, I, I showed him, there was a, a, so does anybody remember uh, Stage Fright, the vulnerability on Android 2015? And um, I, was, I was looking for this secure coding book and it said, uh, it was written in 2003, I think. So stage fright was an integer overflow uh, issue. And it said, um, you know, here's how you solve integer overflow books. And then it said, by 2009, integer overflow books should be a thing of the past. <laughs> and there we were, 2015. <laughs> But, um, you know, so how does education and, and, and fit into this? Can I, can I quickly jump yeah, in again? Yeah, jump in. Yeah, yeah, um, so I think this is a really important thing. And, and you know, when, when, when preparing for this talk, I was thinking about both sort of short-term things that the government can really do to quickly address this, but also I think that one of the government's role is to, is to really do that long-term investment piece, right? And, um, yeah, as you were saying, I think a lot of the stakeholders we spoke to said, why isn't this a core part of all software development courses? And I think the UK is is making some inroads at trying to change that. So the um, the National Cyber Security Centre has a, a specific certification regime for university degrees that uh, include sort of core cyber essentials uh, uh, in in the software development courses uh, for both undergraduate and postgraduate. Um, and also the, the UK's Cyber Security Council is working on the, the sort of formal and structural professionalization of the cyber uh, of the cyber profession, which I think will really help. But I think actually that long term view is one of the most important roles that government has, uh, because it will obviously take a long time for all those people who are being trained to to make a difference in the, in the actual market, right? It, it, it takes a while for those skills to get through the system. But um, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be doing it. Uh, I think there probably is more that governments can do to, to make sure that, that security is uh, almost sort of, it's not an afterthought, right? And that it's, it's there from the beginning. But uh, yeah, I think, I think we've already done some good stuff in the UK and, and I'm, I'm hoping we'll be able to, to expand that further. I'm so glad you brought that up. On Monday, we released, last Monday, the National Cyber Workforce and Education Strategy that addresses exactly this. Um, to your point, yes, the government has a large role in driving towards educating developers or anyone about cybersecurity and cyber in general. And our strategy really 
wants to start at the beginning and really wants to make sure that every person is equipped with some foundational cyber skills that we can then build upon. Because we recognize that having skills-based hiring, skills-based training is going to be essential to doing exactly this, right? If when you became a developer, you didn't have security as part of uh, your curriculum, that should not mean that part of your professional evolution does not include training that focuses on security. Your skill set should evolve with the ecosystem and the things that we now recognize that we need. And so we need to build an education and training apparatus and a broader ecosystem that supports you on that professional journey. It is a, it is a project for everyone though, right? We should not only look to our governments to drive this, but private sector, community organizations, all of us need to band together to really think about what those pieces and parts are. That said, on the other side, one of the things we talk about in the national cybersecurity strategy is that we should be shifting the burden from the small players to the big players. So in that education journey, we should be thinking about how we put more of the onus on the tools that developers use to build security into the, the, the cycle, the life cycle, the frameworks, the tools that they use to develop code and implement it into a code base as another avenue for advancing security outcomes. So we need to pair these things up. But I encourage you to read that strategy because it talks a lot, the, the workforce strategy, because it talks a lot about partnering with universities and um, employers to better understand their needs and to drive education outcomes. It talks about accreditation bodies. It is not an easy thing to change curriculum at any level, whether it's K through 12 or at the university level. And so that is a long-term investment that we must make now if we want to see the dividends paid out from that. But we also, as organizations, to demand of and prepare our um, staff for those things. I mean, if we are going to do the things that we talked about in terms of secure by design and driving towards a more secure ecosystem, then that means we have to equip the people to support that work. And so recognizing that every profession that works in the technology space, which is why the, the strategy is focused on cyber, not cybersecurity, requires you to have some measure of security skills is something we articulate very clearly in the strategy because quite frankly, our engineers, our developers, they should all understand what security is and how it can be built into the things that they make while we still have cybersecurity practitioners who can focus on endpoint security and some of the other things. So since, <clears throat> since they've got the important high-level views, I will say that I know some developers. I'm even friends with a few of them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to say that they're not smart, but I'm <clears throat> also not going to say that they're paying attention. They have to pay every two months there's a new framework. Every three months there's a new platform. They're busy trying to keep up with tech. And we've tried. So the next generation definitely needs to be included. But one of the things we're going to be doing is, one, how do we make it so that they don't have to think about security? This is the famous shift left model. This is the famous, uh, the second DevSecOps is, what are the tools that we can bring into the process so that you can't commit code that goes, pulls from something that's known bad. Uh, that your repo that you're pulling from is actually maintained by the security team as well as the dev team. Uh, and so there are things that we can do today as we move towards this. And then again, also shifting to better ecosystems. You can't do a buffer overflow in Golang. Actually, it's not true. I saw someone try to figure out how, but it was really hard. Like, it was a very smart person to figure out. So, um, and that gets back to the model of what are, we, what are we trying to do? What are the threats? And there are a couple things. One of them is just known badness. And Rick Camille's talked a lot about vulnerabilities, uh, and we, we know that world, and it's not just the, the public ecosystems, it's not just the CVEs, there are private feeds. But there are other types of known badness. So uh, resilience is this huge issue in open source. Uh, last Christmas, there was a great blog post by a French open source developer, not in the security field. And the title of the blog post was, I am not your supply chain. Uh, because 
from his perspective, he provides software as is. Any other problems you have are your problems. Now, that's not true for when the US government buys software. It's our problem and it's our supplier's problem. And so that's the fun tension of thinking about that resilience. What do we do about, I, I hate the term bus problem, called the ukulele problem. Most people don't know that it's a lot more fun to learn to play the ukulele than it is to maintain open source software. Uh, and so we need to make sure that projects won't go away if someone decides to do something a lot more fun. And then one, one more thing that I also want to put on the table that sort of in the known badness capability, it's a little more subtle, <clears throat> is tech debt. Um, right, we, we have got to find a way of wrestling this and this is one of those key for resilience models where if you're about to buy a product or buy into uh, an architecture, what's that going to cost you? What's your total cost of ownership? Because if, you're, if, if what you're buying is already outdated, uh, then you're going to have some real problems down the road and for, not even a security issue. This is a dollar and cents issue. Someone's gonna pay for it and who is going to end up bearing that cost? Yeah, so this is what was springing to mind as I was listening to this, so as a software developer myself, and I think there was a recent tweet that we all saw about um, this demand that had come down to this open source library developer saying, you know, there's a serious vulnerability in your, in your library, you need to fix it now, within the next 48 hours. And this guy, I think quite rightly pointed out, he said, like, I recognize the severity of this issue, I'm not, like, saying that's, that's not an issue. He said, but, like, I don't get paid for this. And you're, like, this big tech company and you're using my stuff for free. And I think this has been a perennial problem for anyone involved in open source is, is basically these companies are essentially abusing open source. Half of them aren't contributing anything back. Some of them aren't declaring they're using it. And they're, you know, it's the XKCD picture with Dave at the bottom, right? Maintaining this vitally critical library. Like, you know, what, what do we do to compensate open source developers or prevent big tech companies essentially creating their own forks and maintaining and then syncing it whenever they like? How do we deal with that problem? I think those are the points about building things into the tools that make it easier for developers to you know, incorporate security from the beginning. And also the liability structure. I know that you know, building out a liability structure will be complex, it will be tough, and what we are trying to do is make sure that we are doing it in partnership with developers and companies to understand the implications of what we are trying to build. But if liability falls on organizations, not on developers, um, it can start to incentivize an ecosystem where they're not abusing developers, where developers are feeding into something that doesn't disincentivize them from participating and from creating these things. It is a feeding ecosystem apparatus, right? This, this should help with those market shifts. I mean, it won't be the only thing that drives that, but I do think software liability um, will need to be a tool in our toolkit if we are going to drive towards um, remediating that kind of abuse of developers and driving towards the security outcomes that we want to see. So on, on top of that, actually, I just want to add to this. So one of the other problems that we have with open source, the sort of uh, paradox, which is, well, open source is available to everyone to peer review. But as we all know, the only people who are peer reviewing the security bits are usually <laughs> the people who want to break it and attack it. Um, is, there, is there any way that we can, can solve uh, that issue in the future, or is that is that really part and parcel of, of what you're putting forward in terms of shifting the market so that the companies take responsibility for the open source they're using and essentially pay these people? Is that right? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think what we need is a structure that makes it very clear who's accountable, and then that will drive where we see that review happening, right? If it's not the developers and it's the organization, then they'll do the peer review to make sure that the code is sound before they put it into uh, their code base. They will keep an eye on it, they'll maintain it, they'll know what vulnerabilities they're introducing into their environment. If we don't, 
then there's no incentive on either end to do anything about that. And we continue to hope that developers will maintain their code that they created out of the goodness of their heart or to assume that companies, especially the smaller ones, not necessarily the bigger ones, they might have the infrastructure and the staffing to be able to review code line by line. But these smaller organizations that are trusting that this thing that they grabbed or have no idea that some developer that they hired to help them build out a thing um, is using open source code, they don't have the infrastructure and the support to be able to, to do that peer review. So how do we build out an environment that really helps you know where the accountability lies and then you'll build in the infrastructure to be able to use that? So <clears throat> there are some built-in advantages to the ecosystem as well. So there are a couple dozen startups out there that just say, oh, well, how are we going to test our tool and show that it scales? We will just run our tool against all the source on GitHub and identify and propose things and, and measure things. So that's one piece where there are some structural advantages that we can start to do. And there are innovators that are starting to engage in this. One of the challenges we're working on collectively with CISA and the White House is, you'd be surprised, everyone thinks the government has a lot of money. And they're not wrong. But it turns out it's surprisingly hard for us to spend it in new ways. And so that's some of the work we're doing. Uh, so that's one piece. Two is figuring out where to prioritize. So there's a great research by an old friend of mine, Frank Nagel up at Harvard Business, uh, that has sort of said, well, what are the most used open source libraries? Uh, but like a lot of research, that data came from the data that we had, which was modern applications. So we found out, right, hey, this is what's used in modern apps. CISA cares about really fun web applications. We do. But our real priority is saving lives. It's the fundamental risks that affect all of society. And so one of our projects that I'm really excited about that, believe it or not, CISA has an office, DHS is an office of the chief economist. Uh, so our economists are partnering with our vulnerability experts to figure out uh, what are the most important pieces of open source software for critical infrastructure uh, measured quite broadly? And so that's going to allow us to sort of say, this is where we should be focusing. I also want to flag one thing. Uh, I feel in security, we don't often give ourselves a little pat on the back. So I want to acknowledge something that we've learned to do. One of the first things I tackled when I joined government uh, back in 20, 14 or something like that, was look at vulnerability disclosure. And those of you who've been in DEF CON for a while, <clears throat> excuse me, those of you who've been coming from DEF CON for a while, remember it was not that long ago when that was a controversial topic. That was fighting words, right? You remember no free bugs? Um, and this is now a solved problem. Our friends in the UK have openly embraced it. Our friends in the Netherlands have been way ahead of the United States on embracing the role of legitimate security. Um, governments from around the world in different parts of the US government are all coming to DEF CON. Why? Because we want to embrace the security research community. So in the open source, that, that is sort of one of those fundamental pieces of resilience that I think we've got solved. Even the most vicious corporate lawyers have at least been yelled at by their PR team saying, if you sue this hacker, it will go poorly for us. Even if we're right, uh, it will not go well for us. We'll lose in the court of public opinion. And so that's one of those areas where we can sort of build on that success. And, and I think we should acknowledge that that's progress that's been made. Um, Charlie. Yeah, sorry. I mean, uh, I'll, yeah. I'll try not to add, add too much. I mean, I think we did look specifically at the barriers of, of uh, uh, open source, uh, the open source community to sort of high levels of security as a part of our core for views. And I think uh, obviously there's sort of the first thing that comes up when you speak to people about it is essentially funding, right? And we need more funding. And, and I think actually, uh, you know, one of the things we really wanted to investigate was uh, the government's uh, as an actual player in the open source system, right? Uh, a, a developer that uses uh, open source code, but also, uh, uh, you know, someone who buys code which is based on open source components. Um, and I think uh, that's definitely something that we're thinking about moving moving forward, right? Uh, how, how do we lead by example 
as a responsible player ourselves in the open source ecosystem, uh, and, and I think that's really important. Um, I'd say the only thing I have, a, I have. A, I think we have made loads of progress, and I do want to pat us on the back. But I was actually quite surprised during our call for views at how many people, how many security researchers we have still heard contacting companies with vulnerabilities and being either ignored or threatened with legal action. You know, I mean, I think, I think uh, we have made loads of progress. But one of the things from the UK perspective we're really keen on doing is is understanding what really needs to be completely consistent practice here. And I think vulnerability disclosure is one of them. And you know, we're not at 100% yet. I don't think we necessarily w will be, but um, uh, it's definitely something that we we want to continue raising the standard on uh, because you know security researchers play an absolutely essential role not only in in uh, building that evidence base but also in actually holding these companies to account. Uh, and, and I think that's something that we really need to, to defend and and to respect. I just want to double down on the point about looking at governments and interrogating our use. That is a big part of the work that we're doing as well, and I'm glad to hear Charlie mention it, because it's really important for us as players in the space and as some of the largest users of open source software and software in general to use our purchasing power to drive the market. That is one of those market tools that I was talking about, and demanding of our supply chain, that they think about these issues is a really important first step towards shifting the market and towards understanding the problem better. I mean, you'll see that in EO 14028, we talked about SBOMs and asking of our suppliers to think about how they will leverage SBOMs and what we, and, and, and helping us map out how we make sure that's a part of our procurement process, right? And thinking about how we are leveraging our purchasing power to drive the market. So I just really wanted to underscore that, that, that federal piece is a big, big piece. And we should be leading by example. And that interrogation of our opportunities to advance this work are really important. So not only our purchasing power, but how can we spend grant money? How can we wrap this as a requirement into grants that we are already giving on relevant topics? Things like that are ways that we are also looking at shifting the market. OK. And I mean, I've also noticed um, as a developer, you know, where uh, things are shifting forward on parallel, parallel fronts. So you, um, you know, where, where you're just putting stuff on GitHub, you can scan that code to see whether there's, you've introduced a vulnerability. Um, also Google, for example, have, have done some good things with their IDEs to make sure that, you know, for example, you don't have an HTTP only connection, that that's a dangerous function, or you're not using SMS, it costs that as a dangerous function. So it kind of steers developers on the, onto the right track. But of course, we, you know, Alan alluded to the fact that we have so much um, legacy out there and existing technical and security debt. Um, and so for all those factories that have got embedded systems and, and those things that are out there globally, because, you know, we, you know, relatively we're British and American, so we live in rich countries, but most of the world isn't rich. And, um, you know, for those, we can't just rip and replace all of that equipment. It's going to be out there for a long time. I was talking to somebody earlier about 6G, you know. So when 6G is deployed, suddenly, you know, after 2035, we're suddenly on the apocalypse, 2038. There will be kit out there in 2038 that's going to be victim to that. So what do we do about the, the legacy? So <clears throat> Camille, of course, has another strategy that she's going to talk about. But, um, there, there are some things that we can do at the technical level as well. So one of the things that we're going to be rolling out over the next year or so is, uh, or I'll, I'll talk about two initiatives I'm really excited about at CISA. Um, one of them, we're still trying to figure out the appropriate name for it. I'm, I'm notoriously bad at naming things. Uh, VEX is my fault. Um, but tentatively called Software Observable Behavior Analytics, which is I can't change the software to thing. But what I can do is watch that software. Uh, and it's weird, just as for me, it's bananas that people sell software without knowing what's in their own software. We also want to extend that to what's it going to do on my network? Is this ever going to use UDP? Uh, what's the maximum size of a DNS lookup that it's going to make? Um, what's the port server open? And that will allow us to take something that is currently a little expensive, which is manually lock down a network and enable 
better and more intelligent and easier to use software that I can just put on my network and say, deny everything that doesn't fit into this box. And we should be asking the question, why would you sell me something if you can't tell me what it's gonna do on my network? So that's one piece. Uh, tentatively called SOBA because right now, everyone names all their security projects after food. So why, why should it just be tex -Mex food? Um, the second piece uh, that, that we're sort of looking at gets a little bit to this, which is, and it still follows the model that transparency is the first step that we can innovate on top of, is there really isn't a good way of understanding what is actually end of life or end of support. And so uh, the White House issued uh, the uh, National Cyber Strategy Implementation Plan, and one of the things they've asked CISA to do is to come up with a solution for helping people who make software, people who buy software, and people who operate software, and that's, I think, all of us, uh, to understand what is end of life, what is end of support. Does it have the solution? What do we do now? No, but at least it helps us prioritize that. And so that's something that we're starting to roll out. Uh, there's a great uh, technical working group that we're participating in. Uh, my team member Justin back there is going to be doing all the technical standards work uh, for uh, this as an OASIS standard. So there's lots of things that we can do without rip and replace to make some progress. Um, yeah, I mean, very quickly, I think, going back to open source, right? I mean, one of the, one of the useful things about open source is that it's largely free. <laughs> um, and I think, uh, uh, that's something that we always want to support and, uh, and, and from a security standpoint should also make sure that as much as possible we're making, uh, you, you know, making solutions to some of these problems available to everyone around the world. You know? uh, I think um, obviously there's, uh, there are problems in terms of global access to tech that uh, extend far past software. You know? I mean, there are lots of cars which are heavily polluting in uh, countries uh, around the world which are not legally allowed to buy in the EU and so they get shipped elsewhere. I think there are obviously structural problems there, right? Um, and, and some of that needs to be dealt with at the, at the multilateral level. Um, uh, but obviously some of it can be helped with funding. But uh, at, you know, in terms of the global software community, uh, open source is obviously going to be key to that as well. So I'll just add that in partnership with State Department, USAID, and increasingly Peace Corps, we are really thinking about how we bring our partners on along for the journey, right? There are a set of partners, like the ones represented here, who are working in lockstep about advancing this forward and are really thinking proactively and have the resources, as you mentioned, to invest in this problem space. There are other partners who can benefit from our lessons learned and the best practices that we have developed to implement things like monitoring and other tools if they cannot invest in um, upgrading their technology right now to help mitigate the risks that are in front of them. And so we are doing a lot of work to reach out to partners across um, a number of different regions. For example, we were talking earlier about the workforce challenge and as part of releasing that strategy, we recognize that the implementation is very little bit federal government and a lot of bit everybody else, <laughs> to be frank. So how do we co coalesce and convene everybody around that? And one of the ways that we have done that is that a, a lot of our partners have already stood up to say, like, I'm ready to implement this work. I see how important this is. One such organization is CyberSafe Foundation, based out of Nigeria, but is working in seven plus countries across Africa. And they are going to translate the ecosystem model that we've articulated for the continent of Africa so that that can be a tool to help developers, to help cyber talent as they emerge and as they continue to reskill and upskill be able to do exactly this, be able to address the threats as they manifest themselves in that ecosystem and relevant to that ecosystem. So it might not be that we can just upgrade all the technology, but how else can they um, leverage the resources at their disposal and the, the skills at their disposal to mitigate the risks in front of them? Okay, um, I feel like there's a number of directions we could take this conversation, um, and I was just about to ask some questions about post quantum. But um, um, <laughs> if so, but focusing, I mean, obviously, we, there are strategies we can take that are not just about rip and replace. We can maybe contain things that we know are, you know, sketchy, and maybe monitor them more closely or validate the input more closely, whatever. But just concentrate on the end of life question here. 
Um, so there's all this debate around right to repair and code escrow, and we see, you know, my specialism is really IoT, and you see lots of these IoT companies that were around in 2015, next big thing, now going bust, and people are going, hang on, I've got all this stuff in my house. What, you know, what do you mean? <laughs> I can't use it after 12 months. So when that becomes a bit more critical, but some of that's critical, right? Some of it's maybe life affecting. What do we do in that space around resilience? Is there, is there a clear answer? Is there a strategy from, from governments on that? Or is it something that's in the too hard box right now that we need to look at later? I don't know that it's all the way in the too hard box, but, but it's in the process. I think there are a couple initiatives that seek to address things like that. Um, the IoT labeling initiative, which is an international initiative, is seeking to make clear to you, clearer to users um, what security features their devices have, what end of life looks like, that kind of thing. I think that's more of an awareness tool than it is going to be um, a solution to the problem, quite frankly, right? Because any logo on a box is going to be outdated and the, the, the validity of that information changes rapidly, but if we can train folks to actually go beyond the logo and read the, the data embedded underneath, right, that'll be included with that, they'll learn a lot about the devices that are in their homes. They're probably gonna do that on the front end. Will they continue to do that? Maybe not. So that can't be the only solution, but it gets people starting to think about the security of the devices in their home. And as people start to realize and see in real time um, how that can impact the safety for them and their families, that'll be an important tool in our toolkit. The other thing I talked about in the workforce strategy is foundation, foundational cyber skills for everyone, right? And if we posit that reading, writing, and arithmetic are the traditional tools in everyone's toolkit to be a functioning member of society, to help you advance and, and thrive, we say that foundational cyber skills need to be a part of that toolkit too, that everyone should have them, right? And that's not just digital literacy, which is the ability to use the device, turn it off and on, but that's computational literacy, the ability to understand that when you turn on and off a toggle, um, what does that mean in terms of your security and privacy? How does it change the usability? What does that mean for your family? And then digital resilience, the ability to adapt to a changing technological environment. So as there's new features, new risks, that you are able to keep up. Not make you a cybersecurity expert, but just as you um, assess the risks of your physical security, I want you to assess the, assess the risks of your digital safety and security, right? So you might, Charlie, you might walk down the alley because you know karate and are willing to take that risk. Come and bring it on, right? Uh, for me, I don't know karate. I will not be walking down the alley. I will be walking down the well at road, right? I've, done a, I've made a risk calculus, a decision based on who I am, what skills I have, and what I know about the environment. I want people to do that in their digital lives as well. And so that's what those foundational cyber skills will equip people to do. So those are tool tools that we are using to help with problems like that, but those, they're not going to be the end all be all, and they also aren't a solution that manifests um, a, a, an outcome that we'd like to see today, right? Yes, I, mean, I completely agree. I, I don't know karate, uh, but, uh, uh, and I definitely, I, yeah, probably be running rather than uh, anything else. <laughs> um, yeah, so the UK is taking take a very similar approach. We have a um, uh, cyber aware campaign, but also we do sort of lots of training in schools um, and partnership with uh, private organizations to try and you know, generally make sure that uh, particularly sort of through the educational process, people are, you know, cyber awareness and security is now being taught in schools from a foundational level. Uh, and I think that's great. Regarding the sort of end of life question, uh, I think, so, you know, the UK uh, earlier this year, uh, the uh, Product Security and Telecommunications Infrastructure Act, PSTI Act, came, uh, it, it, well, it, it entered royal assent, but we won't get back into the full uh, question of what that means in the British Parliament. Um, no, no, let's, let's reopen the Constitution uh, today. <laughs> if, if you guys do want to hear about that, we talked about it at a reasonable length at B-Sides uh, a couple of days ago, so I can send you the link. We got through quite a few names of monarchs, actually, didn't we? Yeah, yeah, we did. Um, anyway, so it received royal assent in April this year, and uh, it will be coming into force. Uh, in April next year, and one of the three core requirements that that has for uh, IoT, consumer IoT manufacturers, is that they have to communicate the uh, lifespan of the product to consumers. They have to give an indication of how long it will receive updates for, and you know when it will be uh, uh, when it will be sort of closed down. 
um, which I think is a real success and, and something that uh, you know we are interested in looking at in other circumstances. You know, uh, I, I don't think we're at the space where we're considering legislative options yet, but. I don't see why that shouldn't also be a consideration for software more widely if it's uh, you know, something that uh, consumers or organizations are, are, are reliant on. Um, but I think you know, that doesn't solve all the issues. Uh, a company can tell you that they'll update the product for 10 years, but if they then go bust the next year, that doesn't necessarily help. Uh, and I think you know, that that is a, a, a real problem, which um, we are... I think still trying to grapple with. Um, there so are... I should add that in the B2B case, a lot of companies already require code escrow because yeah. they're worried about you know partners going bust and stuff. But it's the B2C space, that customer space, yeah. where they're just left high and dry. David, I'll, I'll ask you a question at code escrow because I had a great conversation about this over lunch. Uh, so code escrow, for those of you who don't know, is before I sign a major contract, I won't demand your source code because you're reluctant to do that, but you need to put it in a vault. So if you go bust, I can access it. But here's my question, which is, anyone who's ever looked at someone else's code, yeah, it's a couple of jokes, uh, is there a successful case study anywhere, and I, I, I don't know the answer, but I think it's a big, great research question for anyone, to find successful examples of code escrow actually leading to sustained maintenance? There is one, actually. Okay. Um, so there was an IoT product that I think Sony took on, and then, but it was the original developer. When Sony dumped the product, it was the original developer who stepped back in. Okay. So I think that's a maybe a little bias issue there. I thought you were going to ask me a different question. I thought you were going to say cryptographic keys and certificates. Yeah. Oh, no, I'm not touching <laughs> the tension between right to repair versus signed updates. That's Yeah, but yeah. not even just signed up. I'm, I'm talking about, like... The thing just won't compile and it won't run. Right. And the services aren't there to be able to make this thing live again. So, and nobody's looking at this problem. At least, you know, as yeah. an IoT person, and, and, and I'll be honest, in the code of practice, the UK code of practice for IoT, you know, we did put that in the two hard box because there were fundamental issues like no default passwords. Right. But it's, I mean, does anyone in the audience have uh, the solution to this? <laughs> it's suddenly it's on the old woke up. Did you see yeah. that? <laughs> I'm on my phone. I'm on Twitter. <laughs> so I, 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 I want to sort of share two, because again, when a problem is too hard to solve at one level, you sort of look around for what are my other levers. Uh, and to, to make this international, I, I, I don't speak for our friends at the Ministry of Information and Communication in Japan, but I do want to highlight something that they did and one of the surprising findings. So. Four years ago, uh, and this is why I love, and the importance of giving a global view, by the way, is there are innovators everywhere on the planet, and so that's where we should all be learning from each other. Uh, that ministry uh, obtained the ability to scan the Japanese domestic uh, IP space for home uh, internet users, and they were looking their plan was we'll find all these vulnerability devices and we'll have a way of notifying them through their ISP so it won't be the government coming, they, that's not what they say, but yeah, that's what we say. Uh, <laughs> the, it won't be the government coming and like interfering with them. But the surprising result, which was obvious in retrospect, is they found very, very few vulnerable devices. Now, Japan's a pretty connected country. Why was this? And it's because we've accidentally built a really powerful and almost flawless firewall for every internet user in certain areas. Anyone know what it is? There's a gentleman in the front. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yes, it's a network address translation. Like, we failed at the IPv6 translation model. We're still using IPv4, so now everyone sits behind a data diode um, for the safety critical stuff for medical devices, for uh, the world. That's where we actually need to say, once you're on the internet, this is why Mirai affected security cameras, is because those were connected directly to the internet. And so one of the things we need to do is look at our large scale protection systems, uh, our, our, you know, the, the SASEs and the WAN firewalls and things like that, and say, how do we know that they're doing their job because, hey, guess what? Over the last couple of years, 
there's been a lot of very high profile vulnerabilities around that. So let's look at the network level and the appliance level as an alternative model for this. So, okay, so then resilience further up the supply chain um, and I guess accountability is then the next question. So, you know, we're, we don't have a global model for this and a lot of those suppliers of those, com uh, of those uh, products are in, say, China, for example, or other parts of the world where we don't have any real jurisdiction. We can deal with maybe the importation, but how do we ensure accountability in a, to create resiliency? Does anybody have a view on that? I can go first Simple if you question. want. Um, <laughs> I think, I think there are lots of different uh, aspects of accountability. And, and one of the things we've really been looking at uh, in the UK is, is, is uh, mechanisms for accountability that are, are actually already there, but just might not be being used enough. So actually, one of the key ways in which suppliers of software can be held to account uh, is by their customers through the contract. Um, but a key challenge there is that, uh, one, you have, uh, when we're looking at organizational resilience in the United Kingdom, um, a, the significant majority of organizations are small and medium-sized businesses, often who don't have a dedicated security person at all, let alone serious resource to actually uh, dedicate to really looking into this. Um, often the people who are actually making these decisions and agreeing the contracts are procurement professionals, of which, and, and, and for them, cyber risk is one of a great number of risks which they need to take into consideration. Um, so the question really is, how do you empower those businesses to actually, um, you know, hold these companies to account uh, in a way that, that, that sort of is con contractually uh, viable, as it were? Uh, so one of the things that we've been looking at is whether you can develop actually sort of standardized clauses, which any company could essentially sort of take and put into their contract, which would at least set a, a baseline standard of security expectations in any relationship. Um, but I think you know that there are key challenges here in terms of just the basic ability of procurement professionals and small businesses to interpret and understand the challenges. Uh, and even small businesses are often using more than a hundred different kinds of software a, a lot of the time, and um, and and that is a real challenge. So I think we do also need to think about how we can upskill small businesses uh, as government, whether through funding or programs or otherwise, uh, in, in a way that actually lets them hold. Uh, uh, software, software vendors and software developers to account uh, through the contract. But I do think that there is a sort of a, another aspect here which goes back to transparency, right? So even if you have a company which has the skills and has the resources and has the expertise to ask the right questions of their software vendors, quite a lot of the time they're just meeting a brick wall. You know, they're not being given the information they need. And we have heard that you know, particularly with the larger vendors, things have been getting better in the last few few years and they've been a bit more open about their security practices and how they securely develop their software. But I think there is clearly a lot a long way to go, particularly with like sort of smaller and medium sized software vendors. So I think there's a big question about how you empower people to hold companies accountable, but the transparency question is also key. And I think you do need both the accountability and the transparency if we're really gonna raise the standards of software security across the board. I think where you leave off is where the government needs to pick up. Yeah. And one of the things that you know, I mentioned about the national cybersecurity strategy is we're trying to shift the burden from the small players to the big players. It should be that our cloud service providers, it should be that our large software vendors are held to account to make sure that code is secure, to make sure technology and hardware are secure, and they should be thinking about how all of those things come together. And so a lot of the work that we're doing is kind of picking up where that leaves off and driving towards how do we hold those big players accountable. Some of that is by starting with our own infrastructure and the things that we procure, but also that's where those liability frameworks and some of those other things come into play, is holding them to account and engaging them in this process. That ongoing conversation has been a big part of shifting some of these bigger players to act in the, the manner that we have, have wanted them to. So we engaged very directly with a number of companies on the open source software question, um, particularly around memory unsafe languages. 
And recently, you probably saw that Microsoft announced that they'll, over the next 10 years or so, be migrating their code base from C and C++, memory unsafe languages, to Rust. That's a huge win. And that started just from engagement. We didn't even have to get to the point where we were building out liability frameworks and that kind of thing. And so this shift that we've got of engaging ecosystem partners to be a part of the ideation and solutioning, having these conversations, especially with these bigger players, is starting to, um, to drive and catalyze the kind of action that we want to see. The other venue I just want to highlight is international standards bodies. We really need to engage more in international standards bodies because that's where a lot of the frameworks that folks are using start. And that is where a lot of our engineers and developers are um, getting some some measure of training, right? Talking to their peers in these in these forums. And organizations, small, medium, and large, should be encouraging their security teams, their technical teams, to participate in standards bodies, to both share and to learn as those standards evolve. And so that's another op opportunity for us to evolve that. Yeah, go. I think you've got to get to the microphone, yeah. Hi. Uh, a question about international standards bodies. Uh, standards bodies like the W3C have IPR policies where you have to covenant not to invoke your IP against people who implement standards. What about comparable covenants to say that if you are given a right through standardization such as an anti-circumvention right or tortious interference right that would allow you to silence a security researcher who comes forward with a bona fide claim about a defect in a product covered under the standard that is a condition of membership the SDO can force vendors to covenant non-aggression against security researchers who make those disclosures. I wonder if that's um, going to happen. I was actually just thinking about W3C just then because, um, so I was uh, involved in W3C for a long time. And um, I remember uh, Thomas Rosler, who's there, um, encouraging somebody to come and help out um, because this guy who worked for a big security software company highlighted all these issues of HTML5. And he said, come and join us, come and, come and help us, because you know, we really need more security people. And he went, I don't do standards. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> but, but on, that, um, on that bit about the, the, the pulling those kind of rules in, I think that would be really, really helpful. And actually, we're just trying to get to the point where we're getting CVD for, specifically for standards. So, for example, for 3GPP and Etsy, they have CBD schemes in place now, which is which is great. And, and the one thing I'll say is I, I, I like that idea. You, we, we had a fun discussion about, you know, hey, CBD is now a very common practice, not universal, still some edge cases, but we made a lot of progress on it. The, the one challenge for things like widely implemented standards, especially if it's a flaw in the standard itself, uh, is that multi-party CBD is a com increasingly common use case in CBD. Uh, there's a very good guide that came out of the Software Engineering Institute and first.org uh, that we're working on, but that's something where we want to help promote the muscle memory of that. And it's sometimes contentious. So for example, there was a couple of years ago, um, we phrase this as neutrally as possible, a couple of years ago, there was a ship-based vulnerability and the folks that found it and the primary vendors had to figure out who to have inside the trust circle. And they made some decisions about some of their downstream customers who were the ones shipping it, but not certain governments. Uh, and there was a lot of kerfuffle. And I don't know if that's an area where there's a single right answer, or wrong answer. But as we think about this, and this goes to the bigger picture resiliency, um, we've the easy ones have been solved, and so now we're dealing with these more complex issues where we may have to make situational-based judgments. So I think if, if I can zoom out a little bit from that and talk about <laughs> government's uh, involvement in international standards generally, I, I, I you know I do think. Well, Char Charlie, hang on. Let, let's just finish the CBD. Part okay, fine. Good, Sorry. I, I, I do want to like elaborate much more on standards, but I think this. this there's a really important point here, isn't it, about basically treating security research and respect yes. and fundamental issues of software resiliency when it comes to the standards themselves. So there are lots of gaps, like we 
probably both know where a lot of bodies are buried in IETF and W3C, uh, not, not just in the building. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, um, um, so, for example, um, so you talked about multi-party disclosure. So, um, so we, uh, in the mobile industry, we wrote um, an industry-wide CBD scheme, and I think it's the only industry that has one like that. So security researchers, instead of having to go to each company individually, they can come to the GSMA, where it's seen as an industry-wide issue. And so what we've seen is that a lot of those are actually standards-based vulnerabilities. Um, but what we've also done there is facilitated because those vendors and the companies often didn't have a, have a clue how to deal with security researchers. So half the time it was about creating that relationship and saying, look, don't, don't hammer this guy, you know, it's, this, this person's coming to you in good faith. And, and I'll also say that's where governments can play a role. Um, my wonderful colleague Elizabeth Cardona went off to say something much more interesting than us, uh, but CISA has a team as helping with coordinator as last resort with a particular focus on safety critical. Uh, we run the IC, it used to be called ICS CERT, uh, and, and I, I, we work very hard to focus on how do we get things fixed as quickly as possible. And I love David's uh, model, which is like, say, respecting the researcher, but also taking the view of how, to, how are we actually protecting the humans. We, just, we can trail our CBD panel now, can't we, as well? Uh, yeah, it's it's a CBD well, panel, is, yeah. look it up on the channel. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, to go back out, are we, are we continuing on CBD or are we going to stick to I was to just going to make two quick comments. One was, um, in an effort to advance that as well, NIST is doing a lot of work to make sure that security researchers are respected in international bodies. But also, we kind of wanted to elevate the collaboration and the visibility on the importance of security researchers. So we hosted um, our version of Hackers on the Hill, Hackers at the White House, and had a bunch of security researchers come in, learn more about what we're doing, learn so we can learn more about the challenges that they're facing in these international standards bodies and others otherwise, so we can start to ideate on how we how we solution that and how we can advance rules that will help support them in the in that environment. Cool. Okay, so Charlie, I cut you off, but I cut you off for good reason. So, so um, because standards is uh, is a favourite topic at the moment, right? Everyone wants to be in standards. Five years ago, nobody wanted to be involved in standards, but um, so uh, we have all of these standards bodies around the world. Um, Charlie, what's the answer? <laughs> <laughs> Simple. Um, I mean, I think I think you know the UK perspective is is unsurprisingly that these are global issues and they need global solutions, and I think standards bodies play an absolutely essential role in that. Um, during our call for views, one of the things we did consult on was whether the UK should support the development of new standards around software development. Um, and I think generally the view we heard was that the standards are largely out there. Uh, the problem is that people aren't actually using them. Um, and there's that classic XKCD comic again. Uh, second time there's a reference, there's always a reference. Um, about there being 14 international standards and someone says, we need to create a new standard that brings together all these standards, and then the result is that there are 15 international standards. Um, and that's definitely something we want to avoid. So, I mean, I think one of the real uh, values of standards is, is in encouraging that sort of uh, a consistent approach uh, that's sort of interoperable between different countries. And uh, any of the solutions which we're potentially looking at from the UK perspective, we would want to align wherever possible with the appropriate international standards. Um, you know, which standards body you use is, is uh, a, a, another question, and it's a hard one. Um, but I think we're really keen to work with other governments, with the US, with, um, uh, we've been you know, working with the Singaporean government on this and, uh, and a few others, but um, really to, to identify which of those standards are key for getting the fundamentals right in software development, right? And secure development um, is, is, is the most important thing that we need to get right, and, and getting that international alignment is going to be essential, and I think standards are the main way of delivering that. I'll just say that um, that work should be complemented with the bilateral, multilateral engagement yes. that Charlie just highlighted, right? Because there are so many standards bodies, it can get confusing, and you, you don't know where your partners are aligned if you're not engaging with them directly on their direction and the things that they have prioritized. And so that's just a really important complement to that standards organization. 
And I think, sorry, I, I guess the thing I did want to add to that is that the role of governments, right, is, is to add extra authority to those standards by telling people, you need to look at this, you know? And, and that's really where that symbiotic relationship properly comes into its own. And so to tie things back to SBOM, SBOM. Uh, uh, no, like, so, so one of the things, and again, this is in the National Strategy Implementation Plan, uh, is to explicitly partner with our peer governments around the world to make sure that we're all on the same page. Because the last thing that people want is to say, all right, I've got to have, here's the American solution, and here's the Japanese solution, and here's the European solution. Uh, yeah, and then, but I, I also, we have a national standard strategy, uh, which embraces industry-led, uh, oh gosh, uh, consensus-based, there are a bunch of buzzwords in it. Yeah. But I, I do want to put a flag in there, which is especially for the evolving security space, we need to be careful of premature standardization. Uh, and even in the IETF, which embraces rough consensus and running code, guess what, it's like two vendors that are driving it. And not even two vendors, it's like two very excited people who are in a tiny corner of a vendor. Uh, and so this is where we want to say, let's, let's show that it works, show that it can scale, uh, and then make sure that everyone can weigh in as we fine tune it. And so that's one of those areas that, you know, nothing in security is ever easy. Okay, um, we're gonna continue on standards in a minute. Uh, and well, I think we're gonna have, I can't This call question it leads right into that a little bit. <laughs> well, I don't think, we, I was gonna call it something that we can't call it, uh, but um, anyway, think of your, the standards body you most hate, and then we can come back to that. Uh, so, gentlemen, um, I was going to say, gentleman in the grey shirt. Uh, sure, sure. Um, is, it, is that top of So, speaking of international standards, you know, the, we have the RED coming. We have EU, EU harmonization, right, which also encompasses the EU Cybersecurity Act. These dates are like eminent, right? They're like within months for some of them. I was wondering how you were following those policies and how they should be ingested. Was this the Cyber Resilience Act, sorry? Uh, well, it's the EU Cybersecurity Act. Yes. You, and, then, and then that feeds into the Harmonization Act. Of and then also we have the RED out there, which is even more... So, so basically, we've got a ton of policies that have come through from governments and it's overwhelming industry. Correct. And individuals who are having to deal with this and answer vendor questionnaires and all sorts of stuff from Europe, from America, wherever. And um, what was the question? <laughs> Uh, yeah. Do you realise? <laughs> well, so from a UK perspective, in terms of in terms of the burden, um, uh, so we in 2021 published a, a, a higher level strategy called the Plan for Digital Regulation, uh, and that set out our overall uh, plan to make sure that while there are lots of new regulations in cyber, in competition, in online safety. We need to be looking at the picture as a whole, and we also need to make sure that, uh, especially because a lot of uh, these regulations are affecting the same companies, that we're not uh, creating unnecessary duplication, that we're not making it overly burdensome. Um, and, and the international aspect of that is absolutely key. So th th I, in all of the policies we're looking at from, from in the UK, that question of uh, international alignment or at least inter international operability is absolutely at the center of our thinking. Um, I think we don't want to create unnecessary red tape, despite the reputation that uh, most, most bureaucrats have. Um, and at its core, I think we share the same objectives with uh, you know, the, a, lot of the, a lot of the outcomes that the EU is trying to get, a lot of the outcomes that uh, people in the US are developing. We are going to have different ways that we get there. But uh, I think particularly you know, from the UK perspective, one of the things we really want to prioritize is sort of outcomes focused regulatory questions and, and, and outcomes focused uh, uh, processes which allow vendors and any other organizations involved to take their own approach to delivering uh, these solutions. And I think as much as possible, that's what we're trying to do. So uh, international alignment, I think, is, is a key part of that. Yeah, as we develop, uh, uh 
a lot of these standards and, and our, on our path forward, quite frankly, we have made sure to not only include our private sector, but include our international partners and to share the lessons learned and best practices in hopes of all of us driving towards similar solutions and outcomes. So for example, we just had the one year anniversary of the CHIPS Act. You'll see, you're seeing CHIPS Acts pop up all around the world. Um, we have been in direct engagement to share what we are learning about the semiconductor space with our partners. That said, I think the point that Charlie just made is a really important one that we will have different pathways for getting there. We will choose different models in hopes of reaching the same or similar outcomes. I'm not exactly sure <laughs> that any one person or government can solve for that, but that continued bilateral and multilateral engagement and our engagement in these broader bodies has been the best path for us to kind of share those best practices and lessons learned and our path forward. Um, but what tends to happen is one government's going to move out on one thing while we're focused on another thing, and then you know someone gets ahead of someone else. And I don't think we'll ever get past that. But what we have been doing and are very aware of and of talking to our partners about how we then mitigate the pain on, on the industry. Um, and, and so I think you've seen more bodies designed to bring industry into it so that they can, even if it's throw out there like, hey, I have this new obligation over here. How do we marry these things up that's getting into the process? And so I'm hoping the pain is reduced, but I, I just want to be frank that it will take time because we will inevitably in certain areas have different um, plans for how to achieve the same outcome. And if I could just very quickly add, I think this isn't just to be supportive of industry. I mean, that is, it's a strategically desirable outcome for us as well. You know, the more inconsistency or duplication there is in the regulatory environment, whether domestically or internationally, the more that companies can sort of, to some extent, just pick and choose which ones they want, right? And regulatory arbitrage is something we want to minimize. That benefits us as, as, as well as, as you guys. Yeah, really quick, I'll just say we have a regulatory harmonization <laughs> RFI out right now. Please respond to it. These are these are our opportunities to advance a better understanding, yes, for industry, but more so for the entire ecosystem. Uh, the, the one other point I'd make in terms of progress that I've seen inside my short tenure in the U.S. government is we have chunks of governments that their job is to work with other countries. Uh, and for a while, they were pretty stoked. Like they were diplomats, and they were only at a very high level. And increasingly, they're now bringing in the technical experts along with them. So when we meet with our counterparts, uh, we actually have engineers in the room or our security experts in the room who can say, OK, that's great, but here's, here's a specific issue that you're, you're glossing over something like that. So that's, that's where we're trying to make progress in the process side. And, and, and just to <laughs> brag a little bit about uh, the UK's IoT work, like, and, and together with the US as well, I think the, the countries that work together to basically create defragmentation of what good looks like in IoT standards, I think, does set a really good model for how we can work in the future because it, it is, is really the opposite of that XKCD comic that you mentioned. We actually did manage to achieve a lot of harmonization. But uh, sorry, you've been waiting very patiently there for a question. No, it's perfectly fine. And, but I, it's a question in a completely different direction. I hope. Yeah, no, okay. no, no. We're happy to go in another direction. Yeah. NFTs, so, is it? Uh, no, no, no NFTs. Uh, no <laughs> NFTs and, and no AI. Uh, We've, we're talking about resilience, right? As I were talking about resilience and covering from ICS all the way down to SMB, right? Now, the harsh reality for most organizations is that they are not going to, they are being hit by uh, open RDP. They are being hit by uh, poor, adopt, poor adoption of MFA. They are being hit by difficulties patching existing code. I would love to hear your perspectives on what can we do to help these organizations. Uh, this is not about asking them to meet another standard. This is not about uh, uh, pointing them to, as much as I love them, memory safe languages, right? How are we helping the, 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 the proverbial dentist or the, that, that needs, uh, uh, that needs so to fix RDP? practical on the ground stuff they can do 
Uh, actually, we, we uh, at B-Sides, we, um, we talked about e agri-tech and uh, I actually looked at um, some British stuff uh, from the National Farmers Union, which the NTSC had written, and it, it was basically generic advice about MFA and stuff that was too technical, I think, for any farmer that I know that's a mate of mine. And then I'm, I don't think it would achieve the di desired objective. So I'm kind of interested as well to see you know, what practical stuff can we do to protect retailers and small businesses yeah. now? Yeah, it's, it's a really tough question. Um, I think part of it needs to be industry-led solutions. Um, you know, I think we as government need to be really encouraging uh, the industry to be creating new ways to reduce the complexity and to make it easier for organizations to, to secure themselves. Um, you know, we, uh, as a part of our call for views, consulted on whether the government should even be looking into trying to fund these industry tools to, to create the market for ourselves. Now, that is, is I think we you know, had mixed reviews on that, and uh, uh, I think we'll see where it goes. But uh, the point is that technology can often really be a helpful solution, um, and, uh, you know, guidance is useful, but people need to actually read it, and people need to... Uh, to use it and obviously as, as we talked about before these are often small businesses operating on an absolute shoestring and, and none of whom are cybersecurity experts. Um, I think part of this does go back to what uh, Camille was talking about before and about the shifting of responsibility to companies who can actually have that resource but also have the, the more centralized control. You know, I think in the UK we really agree with uh, uh, the point made in, in the uh, US cyber strategy that we need to be giving responsibility to the people who are best placed in the whole ecosystem to actually deal with the problems. Um, you know, immediate solutions are hard, uh, and I don't think we're going to solve them over, overnight. Um, but I do think if we, if we, you know, the more we can move control over that in terms of maintenance and use to the companies who actually, uh, you know, develop and maintain the software, the, the better it'll be. But you know, obviously there are cyber challenges which or even outside of that, right? You can have the most secure software ecosystem in the world, but still in the UK, the majority of cyber attacks are, are you know, phishing uh, and, and, and simple things. You can't solve all of that, but I think um, a, a big part of it is training, uh, and a big part of it needs to be uh, empowering organizations to actually uh, know what they need to do and, and, and to take those basic steps. So what does CISA have in common with 90s metal fans and the Lockpick Village? We love tools. Uh, and, uh, right, so we, can look, we have some lessons. We can look at the past where things that used to be very advanced and had to be described in sort of very fluffy, not actionable guidance, threat intelligence, uh, static analysis. Any remember what static analysis used to be like 10 years ago? Here's a giant list of things that are completely irrelevant to your product. Um, and now we've had the tools and the entire marketplace has now shifted to, we will help you parse which ones are important. So this isn't a perfect approach, but we do have to acknowledge that things start rarefied and being used by very resourced organizations. And then everyone looks to say, well, yeah, I can make money selling to a bank. But you know what would be even better? Is selling to 10,000 medium-sized enterprises. Uh, and so that's, you know, understanding what's the policy part and where's the engagement part to actually help, I'm going to use the term trickle down, but actually helping these things scale and integrate and be part of what companies are already spending money on. Yeah, so to echo that, the that shifting of burden, the education and training, all of those are some of the longer term solutions, but more tactically. Um, one of the things that I found most frustrating when I used to work at the Department of Homeland Security was how few people, how few organizations understood the resources out of what was then MPPD is now CISA to support small and medium businesses and businesses of any size really, but small and medium businesses. There are educational materials there, but also you could get actual support to harden your networks, to remediate a attack. And, and that's something that we have been working really hard to make sure that organizations across the ecosystem and the landscape know about. Um, and, and there are similar resources in other countries that really are there to support the small and medium businesses and all businesses, but really the small and medium businesses that don't have the infrastructure themselves 
to be able to address the attacks that they're, that they're seeing. Um, more tactically, also, I mean, we have a small business cybersecurity summit in October through SBA. They're doing a lot of work to educate small businesses. We are quite literally, as a government, on a road show to make sure that small and bu medium businesses feel seen and are just kind of tracking this issue in general and know where their resources are. Um, we've been engaging philanthropy in building out tools that can be more wildly, widely available. And so we're getting more creative about how we engage all the members of the ecosystem, right? So we're convening philanthropy, we're convening the nonprofit sector who often provides a number of tools for small organizations. How do we make sure that they're getting the support they need from the large organizations or have the tools that they need to be able to make sound purchasing and secure and defensible purchasing decisions so that when they then build this other tool that supports all of these small and medium organizations, particularly in the nonprofit sector, that they are buying some Thing that has already contemplated these issues. You'll see in the National Cyber Workforce Strategy, we talk about fractional hiring. How do we share talent and resources such that an organization that cannot afford to have a cybersecurity resource on staff all of the time can have one-fourth of their time while this other organization has one-fourth or one-eighth of their time, and making sure that somebody has access to the information, to the skill sets that they need to harden their systems. Um, and, and I'll just highlight those things, but there, we're, we're trying to get creative with how we reach out. There are so many small view businesses, and this is not their type priority, right? If you are the mom and pop shop who is just trying to service your neighborhood, um, and you're not thinking about this, but there are a lot of great programs coming out of academic institutions where one of the ways they're training students is to go to those stores and help them you know, uh, implement multi-factor authentication, help them um, make sure they have all the security settings turned on in their, um, in their, the programs that they've deployed in their, in their stores. Those are great opportunities for not only training and skill development for the students and for the people who will soon be in our workforce, but it also supports small businesses. So some of that ecosystem model that we're building out through the National Cyber Workforce and Education Strategy are designed to create an ecosystem that feeds itself and supports organizations like that, small and medium businesses, community organizations, et cetera. So I guess, I mean, I, I, I talk on the practical stuff as well. I have noticed, you call it trickle down, I, 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 I think maybe of a, I don't know, a different term, but I don't think it's trickle down, because it's kind of like a top down direction on, you know, secure by design and product security measures being put in all products that are sold into enterprises and, and that end up, so I guess that's the trickle down, but that, that end up in those small businesses, but maybe there's this gap in time when they can't afford to replace it. And that's obviously the, the, the money issue is the who yeah. pays issue is always the issue. The same with rip and replace in mobile networks, you know? There's a lot of burden on, on uh, industry to create resilience and a lot of burden on small businesses and consumers who are stretched at the moment as well. Uh, gentlemen uh, here in Blue Shirt. Great, thank you. Uh, and this may be outside the scope, but if so, just feel free to just gloss over it. But since we're talking about resilience, if we could, I'd like to back up like to the real 30,000 foot view. Is anybody looking at, we're technologists, we like to have technological solutions, we like to make our technology better, we argue about different ways we could do that. But when it does fail, is anybody looking at or, or trying to recommend to companies that they have backup plans for when these things fail. For, for resilience, like literally, like is there an analog solution to this digital problem that we used to have and we used to know how to use? Like Ian McCavery did that report where the, 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 report, the billing system went down or the yeah. employee records went down and they didn't know how to do paper records anymore. They couldn't do that. So is there any kind of non-technical, do we do actually suggest non-technical resi resilient solutions? So, so some companies have had that happen, haven't they, where they had to go back to paper and then realize that maybe they should have done that exercise, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you look at the National Cybersecurity Strategy, it focuses on defensibility and resilience, right? The ability to bounce back. And you'll probably see this a lot in the election space where um, the, the, the guidance that's going out, especially best practices, are really focused on like, do, 
Should you focus on paper ballots? Should there be a backup where folks can vote through the machine, but there also is a printout that they can verify their votes, right? So yes, there are definitely efforts to, fo to focus on that resilience piece, because inevitably, even systems that have been designed with security in mind from the very beginning and privacy in mind from the very beginning will see an attack, will be compromised, right? And so when your defenses are down, how do you get them back up? Um, but some of that is an analog solution. So how do we think about all of those things? And how do you have a plan for your organization that includes the entire C-suite, that everyone is engaged and involved? Those are the parts of the conversation that we're having, not only with the small and medium businesses, but of course with the larger ones as well. So I don't think I have a, uh, I, I'm not sure about specific uh, rules around, around having an, an analog solution, but in, in the UK, we have the um, Network and Information Services Regulations. I think that's what they call the NIS regulations. They're normally known as, and and, and what that really is uh, are rules which focus on on critical national infrastructure and organisations which are you know foundational to the operation of the UK. Uh, and those regulations do have more uh, uh, you know a more strict set of rules around how organisations which so it includes all the major uh, sort of CNI sectors, but also digital service providers, things like cloud uh, cloud computing. We're looking to bring into uh, very soon, um, so that they have plans uh, in place in case of you know everything from small outages to pretty pretty catastrophic uh, uh, you know risks. So I think broadly our approach is, is to prioritise the, the areas that are most critical in that space. But um, I think I think it is a really interesting question about how how organizations which, which aren't thinking about that in, 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 in the way they have to in CNI, uh, you know, how they deal with that. I think it's, I think it's a real challenge. Uh, just two other data points of how this is happening today and how we need to expand it. Uh, one, five years ago, the post Mirai botnet, uh, the Department of Commerce published what's referred to as the botnet report, but basically saying, how do we think about resilience against massive scale automated malware? Um, and one of the things it recommended is, hey, if your network is hit either directly or indirectly, um, binders, right? You gotta have the phone numbers, you gotta have the, these are the IPs, this is, you know, again, if you have a secure facility, how are you going to reboot things? What are some of the less used uh, details that you need to have at your fingertips? Uh, Second piece that we've seen as more and more organizations tabletop against ransomware is again, having that explicit behavior where the executives become aware through engaging against this. And I love there's now a movement to bring in uh, influence from role playing games, which I think a lot of us enjoy, uh, to make tabletops more interesting, more engaging and more real. Uh, right, you know, nothing like a couple of D10s to sort of help you figure out will your decisions actually have an effect. So, and that also gets to people sort of thinking through what happens if I lose this organizational capacity? How will I stay afloat? How do I prioritize? And that speaks directly to the concept of resilience, which is bend but not break. I, I look forward to the invite to your organizational <laughs> resilience, uh, organizational resilience yes. one shot. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, actually, that goes back to our previous discussion about IoT and um, the sort of death of those IoT companies. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, what, what do people, you know, again, back to consumers as well, you know, so they're the victim of a lack of software resiliency in the, in the, in the end of life or that company going bust or whatever. Um, I mean, do we need to be preparing users for... You know that you know. Imagine a large cloud service provider goes bust type situation, or you know when when we wrote that IoT stuff, for example, I couldn't believe that we had to write in there that you know a door lock should still operate. You know, yeah. if the you know it's because some of these companies are just doing this stuff on the bench and and assuming I call it the Silicon Valley problem, which is that oh look, we've always got internet right. <laughs> And, and actually for a lot of people, they do have power outages repeatedly, especially if you live in Wales. So, but I, I think this speaks directly to sort of this, this mission we have of secure by design, secure by default. Um, there are some things we should keep from the 90s. The kids need to know about SCA, but <laughs> consumer, 
Consumer empowerment as a primary technical policy philosophy didn't work. We have successfully taught a decent chunk of consumers to do one thing for security, which is look for the little lock in your browser. And five years ago, that stopped being re relevant with Let's Encrypt. It's not that Let's Encrypt is bad, but now that means something that conveys no semantics. So if our strategy depends on teaching consumers things, we're not going to succeed. And that's why, again, as Camille's been saying, and CISA has, we've got a lot of workshops coming up this week, and there's Bob Lord, who's, who's pioneering this effort, uh, to say, how can we make it so that people don't have to make those decisions. I, I do also think, I mean, I think we do actually need to be careful in part as well. I mean, so the UK has uh, uh, sort of various parts of the UK government which looks at civil contingencies and, and catastrophic events. But I also think, you know, you, you don't necessarily want to start going out with campaigns telling everyone you need to be prepared for what happens when the internet goes down across the country because, uh, you know, ultimately that's the job of governments, that's the job of the companies who run them. And, and, and I think, you know, uh, while it is important people remain aware, and I'm sure many people in this room think, do think a lot about those kind of things, um, you know, you also don't want to don't want to be uh, scaring people unnecessarily. Uh, and I think fundamentally the responsibility is of government and, and, and the organisations involved in that critical national infrastructure. But you know, I think consumer empowerment, where where it works and where we can, is great. But as you say, it's it's not the solution which we can rely on. So this is merely a, a thought experiment just leading on from your question. So, you know, what do we think will happen if, uh, say, a large cloud provider suddenly went bust overnight? Would there, do we think it would be like the banks where they go, that, that, you know, you have to bail them out for the greater good of the, of the users and the disruption that would ensue? And I know that's a controversial statement in itself because that, that's a point of view, but do, do, have any of you guys thought about this just personally or, uh, you know? Uh, yeah, I, I don't think I can commit the British government to bailing out, uh, <laughs> bailing out cloud manufacturers if they go bust. Um, yeah, just Google. Can you bail out Google? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, you know, at the risk of repeating myself, I think uh, part of that is why uh, we are currently looking to update the network and information systems regulations to include more uh, uh, digital service providers and, and digital infrastructure providers because you know, people are reliant on cloud services now in a way that they were not 10 years ago. And, and we need to make sure that, that, that and, and I believe, I, I would need to double check, but I think that sort of um, question of solvency is a part of that. You know, it's not just about having secure data centers and having everything in place. I think it's, it's about the sustainability. And I think from both a government perspective and from a company perspective, making sure that the, um, the availability of those services are there in, in, in those kind of circumstances. But, yeah, I mean, I think it's it's an interesting it's an interesting question. Uh, I, I don't imagine most cloud companies are looking at going bust. It looks like they're probably going the other way, growing bigger. But uh, you know, you never know. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was going to say. I mean, in terms of prioritization of the list of problems that we have yeah. discussed today, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, I don't know how that would happen if the major cloud providers. I mean, everybody stops using them, and then the money runs out. I mean, I think we can <laughs> contingency plan for outages. Um, but them going bust is not a thing that I think most of us have put at the top of the list of challenges to triage, um, nor do I think it's a realistic possibility anytime soon, so I think we're okay. Look forward to that clip uh, when next week's. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so you heard it here first. <laughs> um, so um, we've, we've only got a few more minutes left, so has anybody got a burning question they would like to ask any of the panelists? Or just views they or want to share as well. Yeah. well yes. Yes. I was going to say, you can give the closing remarks, yeah. yeah. So we heard, we've, we've kind of gone across a lot of the landscape, and I didn't get to what I wanted to talk about with standards, but, like, um, has anybody got any ideas about software resiliency in terms of what, what you would like to see? It's too late in the afternoon, you need some coffee, don't you? <laughs> So, okay, so what do you think, what, what keeps you awake at night, Alan? <laughs> so, I, I mean, for me, the question that I sort of worry about is, is why haven't we seen the catastrophic attack? Uh, and I, I 
that's not really something that keeps me awake, but the fact that we spend a lot of time in security and, you know, I, I use the analogy of the Drake equation a lot, which is you've got so many humans, 30,000 people come to the desert every year and learn how to pop shell. Many of them really are a little crazy. And many of those people have very strong opinions about very important institutions. And so I, I, I don't have a good answer for it. And that makes me sort of worry that there, it's just sheer luck that we haven't seen sort of the very large event. Um, and so that's, that's sort of the high level policy question that is way above my pay grade, but I like to raise it for people like Camille. <laughs> I think, I think that the real challenge for us, which we've sort of covered here, is, is really a kind of a core problem of government, which is that you have a limited number of resources and a, an essentially infinite number of challenges. Uh, that's true in cyber as much as it is everywhere else. And that prioritization is hard. And there are always people who might lose out on that. Um, I think one of the things that we're really hoping to do in the UK is listen to as many people as possible to make sure that we are making the right decisions and that there are the right people who are being protected but you know there, there are always things which don't get done um, and and we are uh, we are really keen to make sure that uh, we are at least if, if we make that wrong decision we've been as informed as possible um, so actually uh, it would be remiss of me not to uh, note that uh, our call for views we are probably publishing our sort of response to it in the next few months so anyone who's interested in learning more about what our next steps are in the UK and also sort of actually sharing your views on it. Um, uh, keep an eye out for that, but also I'd obviously happily sort of have a chat afterwards as well. Hashtag advert. <laughs> <laughs> the ability to mitigate risk across a number of different issues all at the same time at scale, at the pace that we need them to be mitigated. That's what keeps me up at night, all night. Um, but I, I do take heart in um, the progress that we have made and the evolution of the role of government and private sector collaboration. We've moved from that public-private, you know, partnership when really was just like throwing threat indicators across the fence to true collaboration. I mean, I think you've heard in everyone po everyone's points how they've worked with a private sector organization of one kind or another, an international organization of one kind or another, to try to advance and end and better understand the implications of the things that we are trying to do. That's an important evolution. It will take time, so it, it doesn't really help my speed and scale <laughs> piece. But I, I take heart in the fact that now, as one of the, the people who like moves back and forth between government and the private sector and has seen how much harm on both sides can be done when they're not talking to each other, um, that institutionalization of the collaboration model and a true understanding of the challenges we seek to solve, um, I think is really important. Thank you. Um, we're going to have to um, shut this down because I want to ask the audience one thing. So, so based on when you stepped into the room, and I know some people have joined us on the way, like Peter, who's just walked in <laughs> one minute before the end. <laughs> yeah, you. <laughs> you enjoyed that panel. So, um, based on when you walked in the room, do you feel now more confident or less confident so, uh, than about uh, government's approach to software res resiliency? So, if you feel more confident, raise your hands now. That's all the government people, isn't it? It's like the, <laughs> it's the staff has come out. I need to put my hand up. <laughs> okay, that, and, and who is less confident? Okay, not so many. Right, so and people, and people the same. Yeah, and so who's in the kind of don't know category, middle no, ground? No, we haven't changed. We like haven't changed. It has to be a valid option. Okay. Yeah. Has changed. Hasn't changed. Hasn't Your view changed. hasn't changed. That, that sounds okay. pessimistic. No, it's not. Maybe, maybe we've been doing no, a great job. We've done it all. Well, let's take another we couple We shouldn't hours. interrogate yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you got time on it. So um, all that remains for me to say is uh, thank you, the audience. Uh, thank you to Camille. Thank you to Charlie. And thank you to Alan. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And, and thank you very much to David for his excellent chairing as well. Yes, thank you.